ever wondered if there are things that you do or that I do in my everyday life that might have an impact on fish or specifically trout or salmon? I mean, when we go to school, when we go to work, the things we buy, when we drive in the car, does any of that play into how healthy fish can be in their native environment? Well, that's a question we're gonna be pondering over these next several months as we continue this video series. We're gonna be looking at how our actions might impact fish for the better or worse, but we're gonna do it in a variety of ways. First of all, in a few minutes, I'm gonna introduce you to my friend, Tom Greer. Tom is a volunteer with Trout Unlimited, and he's created an artificial environment where he is going to hatch trout, steelhead trout in this case, in his artificial environment or an aquarium. Following that, we're gonna then shoot out to the Russian River, which is located just north of San Francisco in California, where Giselle is gonna compare the artificial habitat that Tom's created with the natural habitat where most steelhead are going to survive. Now, a lot of students, much like yourself, or maybe like your classmates, have been sending questions to us asking about rainbow trout, about steelhead trout, about habitat, and we wanna answer those. So Shelly will then work with two fisheries biologists, Derek and Ryan, and they're gonna be answering those questions. Now, as you watch these videos and you go through this process, and I know many of you may be hatching trout in your classroom, if you have questions, we'd like to try to answer them for you as well. At the very end of today's video, on the credits, there will be a place where, two places actually, where you can send your questions in and we will do our best to help you. My name is Ethan Rotman and I work for California Department of Fish and Wildlife and I've got a great job because most of my job is helping students like you hatch trout in your classroom. So I think it's time to go look and see what Tom's got created for us. Hey Tom, you ready for us? I'm ready for you, Ethan, and thanks for the introduction. Welcome to Tank Time with Tom. This week, we're gonna talk about the features in the fish tank that help fish survive and how does the tank replicate the habitat that exists in the wild? Well, let's take a closer look and see what we have. I've got the tank right behind me and uh, we're gonna go in and see some of those elements that make the tank a really habitable place for those fish. So here's our tank. And you can notice right away, obviously we don't have any water in it, but it's a good example of some of the key elements that are used to help the fish survive in this indoor habitat it's, that's, that's not natural. What we're trying to do is replicate what's in nature to give the fish the best possible chance of survival. And obviously the thing we're missing is, is probably one of the most important things. We need water, okay? Clean, clear water is, is critical. Uh, it's gotta be the right temperature. So in order to maintain the temperature, we do have a chiller that's on the back of the tank and that works through the filter. So water gets sucked up through the bottom of this grate, which is a filter plate. It goes through the gravel, then through the filter, up this tube into this little gizmo, and it gets circulated back into the tank, comes out here, right back into the tank, and it provides cold, clear water for the fish. Um, another thing we can do is we attach a thermometer to the side of the tank so we can actually see what that temperature is. And the optimal temperature for uh, salmonids, in this case, we're raising steelhead, is gonna be about 55 degrees. 50 to 55 is, is pretty good. It can float up and down a little bit, but you wanna keep it cool. Uh, the other things that are really, really important is the amount of light and darkness that these have. Um, we do have over here a, a lid, styrofoam lid that I've put a light into and we turn that on during daylight hours. We don't wanna have it on too long and um, that will help the fish maintain a, um, a natural diurnal rhythm of, of light and dark. Um, and they actually use light when the, um, when the eggs start to eye up, they'll, they'll use the light to navigate through the gravel in the wild. They'll be down buried inside the gravel bed. And when they see the light, as they uh, get old enough, they will actually emerge through the gravel and up into the water column. 
Um, the other thing you notice, we've got a lot of styrofoam around the tank. Uh, that helps to keep the water temperature uh, both uh, stable, keeps it cool, and it also keeps light out of the tank. Uh, again, if you have too much light, it might confuse the fish. And as same as too little. So we have ours on so it goes on uh, during normal daylight hours. Um, the other thing you'll notice is the gravel. Okay, the gravel is, um, is, is part of the stream bed. Um, I also have some rocks here. So what that'll do is it'll provide the eggs some habitat so that if there were big fish around, they wouldn't get eaten. Okay, they'll hide amongst the rocks, okay? And they're buried inside the gravel and they'll emerge up and into little fry, really small fry, and they'll swim in, they'll hide in amongst the rocks. And we'll see that as they, um, as they mature in our tank. Um, the water, as I mentioned, is, is, a, is a key feature and we're obviously uh, missing that, but um, the water's gotta be clean. And there's also a, a thing called pH level, which some of you might test and um, we'll use a, a test kit that's common in uh, swimming pools or, or spas, but we're looking for a pH level that's around seven, okay? Um, and uh, the oxygen level is, is also very important. Um, the, the pump that circulates the water will spill water into the, um, into the top of the tank and that'll create some bubbles and, and help to increase the amount of oxygen. So what can you do to help fish survive in the wild. Um, an example might be to turn the water off when you're brushing your teeth between the time you rinse and turn lights off when you're not using them to save electricity. Um, there's a lot of things you can do, so think about it. And um, we're gonna next, we're gonna go stream side. So until next week, thanks for watching, bye-bye. Thanks, Tom. This is Giselle here at Marquis Creek in Santa Rosa. Really fascinating and beautiful place I'm in right now. What's really even more exciting about being here is that it is the perfect habitat for steelhead eggs that we're seeing right now in your classroom. I wonder what all of you notice about the creek and the habitat around me. noticed when I was observing was all the rocks that are all around me underneath my feet on the side of the creek we have rocks everywhere similar to the gravel in Tom's tank these rocks in the stream are perfect for a steelhead to lay her eggs I also noticed the running water and the bubbles these bubbles provide the oxygen that these eggs need to survive in the wild I wonder why the water is so cold. Could it be from the trees in the shade? What do you think the temperature is at? I wonder how cold it really is. Let's test it out. Wow, that was a perfect temperature. Just like us, the steelhead need a healthy habitat in order to survive and thrive. Hi everyone, Shelly here, and that means it's time for Ask a Biologist. It's season two of Steelhead in the Classroom Live, and this time around we have twice the biologists for twice the fun. Joining me today, we have Derek and Ryan, who are both fisheries biologists with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And let me tell you, they know a lot about fish. Our first question today comes from Cora at Arroyo Seco Elementary. Cora asks, what places are good fish watching spots? Derek? That's a great question. I can't think of a good place to watch fish right now. Let's ask my colleague, Ryan. Ryan, what are good fish watching spots? Hi, Derek. 
My favorite spot to watch fish in Sonoma County is at the fish viewing area at the Warm Springs Fish Hatchery. But due to COVID restrictions, all our state fish hatcheries are currently closed for public health safety. However, our local and state parks remain open. Many of our parks provide us an opportunity to observe fish either along a stream side or the lake shoreline. If you're unable to get to one of those places, a great place to observe fish is in your neighborhood creek. Oftentimes people walk across them and never bother to look and see if there are any fish in the creek. The sidewalk or bridge that crosses over the creek provides a great viewpoint to spot fish in the creek. Next time you walk over a creek, take a few minutes to see if you can observe a fish. If you don't see any, don't give up. It takes practice to learn how to spot fish. And you may notice fish are easier to find at different times of the day. This next question is for you, Derek, and it comes to us from Marion at Santa Rosa French American Charter School. Marion asks, what predators are dangerous to all life stages of the trout? Steelhead are predators. However, they themselves are prey for other animals. In the ocean, nearly everything larger than you can eat you. In the ocean, adult salmon are hunted by killer whales, dolphins, sea lions, and fishermen. In rivers, creeks, and lakes, steelhead adults need to evade river otters, bears, and anglers. Steelhead juveniles need to avoid birds like cormorants, osprey, and kingfishers. River otters, bullfrogs, bass, native minnows, sculpin, and even other steelhead, and of course, fishermen. Humans are the one predator that hunts steelhead in all habitats. Steelhead have a complex and varied life history that spans many different habitat types. This variation gives steelhead a competitive advantage over fish that only live in the ocean or only live in fresh water. Interesting. All right, our last question is for you, Ryan, and it comes to us from Cynthia and Myra at MLK Elementary. What tools do biologists use to look at fish? I wish I could show everyone all the cool tools we use to look at fish, but unfortunately, I'm not working in the office today. However, I do have two tools on hand that I use to look at fish. The first is a pair of polarized sunglasses. Polarized sunglasses have a special film on the lenses that reduces reflected light off the water. This helps us see fish better by reducing the glare. You'll often see fishermen wearing the same type of sunglasses to help them catch fish. The second tool is a waterproof camera. I use it to record video of fish underwater. I have a few different attachments I use with it, a selfie stick to extend the camera underwater, a dive um, attachment when I'm snorkeling, and I also have a small tripod I use to set up the camera on the water bottom to video fish as they swim by. Both of these tools have their limitations, especially when the water visibility is poor and it's hard to see fish. One of the most important ways biologists look at fish is by capturing them so we can study them. A lot of our knowledge about fish is based upon fish that have been captured. That was great. What a great job. And I love that underwater footage of the Russian River. That was fabulous. And Tom, I really want to thank you. You gave us some really good advice on how just a small thing that we do could have a very positive impact on the wild fish around us. And if it's okay with you, Tom, I have an idea. I have this jar and a couple things you might notice. It's kind of big. It's also quite empty, nothing in it. But your idea, Tom, that I'm gonna follow personally, and I hope the people watching this follow, I'm gonna use this little rock to represent your idea. And I'm gonna take that rock, your idea, and <laughs> drop it into the jar. Now, my hope is that we're gonna fill this jar with all the good ideas on how we can make a positive impact on trout. Now, one rock in that tiny jar, that eh, doesn't do a whole lot, does it? It's a lot of noise, kind of cool if I want to like start a band or something. But over the next several weeks, I'm hoping that students much like you email us or maybe your teacher will email us and tell us about all the things that you think we can do, all the things that you are doing 
And every time we get one, we're gonna put another rock in this jar and we're gonna see if we can fill it up. I hope you come back and join us because in another week from now, Tom will be getting his eggs and we'd love for you to be there to watch as those eggs go into the tank. As time goes on, every week we're gonna go back to that tank and you're gonna watch those eggs turn into alevin, which is a little baby fish with a huge belly in front. We're gonna watch them grow into fry until eventually Tom is able to release them back into a wild habitat. Every week we're gonna visit Giselle out on the river and every week Shelly, Derek, and Ryan are gonna be with us again. So in the meantime, between now and next video, please be thinking about what you can do, what we can all be doing to help fish survive in the wild. Mm -hmm.